Praise the Lord. Um, <clears throat> sanctification and holiness are much related. Sanctification is when you are, separate yourself unto holiness. Uh, sanctified and meet for the master's use of any man purge himself of these, you know, flee these things, or flee youthful lusts and flee all these things. And if you do that, and you sanctify yourself, you're, you're a vessel uh, fit and meet for the master's use. So purity is what we're after. Purity, sanctification, holiness. They're all interrelated and related to one another. But today it's more of a focus on sanctification. But I will include some uh, scripture here a little bit on, on other things. But uh, I'm going to read this scripture in Romans. Uh, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, this is the beginning of Romans, called to be an apostle, separated or sanctified. See, sanctified is separate. There's a separation from the world, even though physically we're in the world. Remember what Jesus said in the, in the prayer of John 17. I pray not that you take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil. Separate them from the influence of the evil that's in the world. Obviously, we have to have a contact with the world to some degree to fulfill all righteousness, to preach, to leave uh, men without excuse, to touch those who God is saving and drawing unto salvation. There's got to be a demonstrated holy life that's lived before the world. And never has the church failed that more than it has now. The salt has lost its savor. And we related all of that back to the uh, idea that there was no judgment in the house of God. You know, all the false counsels of, I have a right, you don't have a right to tell me what to do. We even hear Matter of God saying, you, you have no right to uh, judge each other. You have no right to say anything about each other. Well, we prove by the scriptures that there is an exercise of judgment for the entire church. Now, you just got to be take heed how you do that. You can't do it carnally. You can't do it in condemnation. But there has to be righteous judgment. That righteous judgment is a mandate, and it is a... Uh, Exercise given to the church, to every member. Remember Paul said in Corinthians, he said, I set the least among you to judge this matter. What, is there not a wise man among you? No, not one wise man that can discern and judge the things of God. Don't you know you're going to judge holy angels? Come on, pick up this exercise. Yeah, it's never given to, to uh, anyone singular. Now, singular man of authority may excel and do more of it than other members, but it's not an exclusive thing, right? That's... right. All right, so holiness and purity and sanctification, sanctified, fit and meet for the master's use. You have to separate yourself. Pray not that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil. Okay, back to Romans. Paul and an apostle separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power. There was a declaration, remember? The Son. There was a declaration. This day have I begotten thee. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Or there had to be a work of sanctification and learning obedience and purification before that voice came from heaven, which came after the baptism of John. And that's how we grow up into the full stature, into the sonship. We endure our baptism of afflictions. We en endure... Uh, and have faith in the operation of God as He sends trials, tests, and temptations. But He also sends the, the, the grace and the mercy and the power of, of His Spirit that we can endure through it. And then after we have been baptized in our affliction, then God will say to us, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten Thee. So, Jesus Christ was declared. There has to be a declaration. God we're looking to bring to find a place of attainment in our walk with God where one day God somehow in some manifestation makes the declaration, Thou art my son. 
Thou art my son. And we talked about the son. When you're in sonship, what do you have? Well, the father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment to the son. So in, as an individual, God can call you sons and daughters of the living God, but then also collectively as a body, we are equal to the Son of God when Jesus is operating through the entire body of, of Christ. We have equal power, influence, authority as the high priest. That is the whole body of Christ together is equal to Jesus the high priest. Even though he is the high priest in heaven, he sends his judgments and his mandates and his executions down and they are uh, brought to pass and declared and executed by the church. So Jesus is declared to be the Son of God with power. Behold, I give unto you power. You shall tread on serpents and scorpions, all the power of the en enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You know, Tarry in Jerusalem and you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Then you shall be my witnesses. In uh, uh, Jude uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. We need power. Power is the Holy Ghost. And God declares you to be a son of God with power. According to what? According to the spirit of holiness. And holiness is the kind of the combination, and I'm winging this definition here, but holiness is kind of the combination of sanctification and then the attainment unto purity and power so that you produce a testimony, an image, a manifestation of the Word of God in your mortal bodies. The image of Christ in our mortal bodies, not our own righteousness. But we have crucified the old man with its affections and lusts. And that old man has been put to death. And those urges and passions and lusts and de desires no longer have power to fulfill themselves in our mortal body. Which mean, leaves room for the Holy Spirit to manifest and fulfill the law of God in our mortal bodies. In all righteousness and holiness and purity and Revelation of the image and glory of God. The expressed image of God. Don't think God don't want to express His image again through His body. He does. And that's why what happens in the body has great importance. And that is why, what's that scripture? That's why the Bible says, this is the will of God. First, let's say this. Be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And what's the principal thing? Wisdom. Get wisdom. So don't be unwise. Get wisdom. And when you get wisdom, be wise and understand what the will of the Lord is. And this is the will of the Lord, even your sanctification. Right? Yes. It's your sanctification. Yeah, that each of you should possess this vessel in sanctification and honor. That's, I got it here. For this is the will of God in your sanctification, that you shall abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Be ye holy, for the Lord your God is holy. And I always I like to say this, be ye holy, but don't be holier. All right. Holy, just be holy, and that's good enough. Don't be holier. Right? You know what I'm saying about that. Don't let the idea of being holy and, and manifesting the righteous God make you feel like you're the cut above other people. You know, what do we have that we haven't received? And we can't glory as though we haven't received it. And every man has his gift. And God has dealt to every man the measure of faith and all of that. We're all in the common salvation. You know, the kings of the earth, uh, they like to exercise lordship and they like to be called uh, the great 
uh, Grand Poobah and I'm the big chief here and uh, I tell you what to do. And Jesus says, I'm not going to be like that with you guys. You are all just all unworthy vessels and whatever you are, whatever you have, whatever your stature is only because of what I have given and put upon you. But all of that, we're getting back to the idea that sanctification is the will of God. So this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And I might read John 17, but Jesus says, And for this cause I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified. And I'll get back to that another scripture or two about that. Do uh, you see where this is going? Uh, sanctification. And, and the, only, the other thing I, I need to emphasize here in Romans is that the declaration of someone who is a son of God you know, a son of God is not without power. You can't be a son of God and have no power. You're declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. holiness. So that's what that, so you want to put it in a nutshell, put it in a phrase, put it in a little sort of spiritual rule, if you will. No holiness, no power. Go back to Thessalonians. God has not called us unto un. Cleanness, what's uncleanness there? Uncleanness is, un, is impurity and motive as well as uh, uncleanness in morality and moral issues. Okay, so uncleanness. God has not called us to live unclean lives. Now, if you do not have holiness, you do not have power. If you're not sanctified, you will not be holy. <laughs> All right, so sanctification is that exercise of recognizing God's call, what God's doing, uh, being moved with fear, and uh, working to separate yourself from uh, methods of thought and patterns of lifestyle and, and ungodly activities and anything that would keep you occupied and involved in things that are not the will of God, that are not profitable, so that you are separated to be used by God unto a holy and clean and righteous work. That's the goal. Sanctification. It's very important. Uh, and this is the will of God, even your sanctification. All right, so that's kind of an introduction to 2 Chronicles 29. I'm going to go to there. And I usually preach this at Passover, but uh, I'm, I'm going to preach it again, but more in reference to sanctification. And I may not read it all, because there's a lot in here. But So 2 Chronicles 29. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 5 and 20 years old, and he reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now this is all to do with restoration. And the reason, I'm, this is the Old Testament kind of uh, major part of a couple of chapters here, 29 and 30, that lay out a whole pattern of restoration. And so what are we living in? We are living in the restoration of the restitution of all things, coming to the end of the age. So God has to restore things. So it becomes a pattern for us. Uh, okay. <clears throat> he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests, the Levites. That represents God's elect. The Levites. Uh, he shall purify the Levites that they may bring forth an offering in righteousness. You know, Moses drew the line and said, uh, you know, who is with me? And the Levites yeah. came. The Levites are us. We're the Levites. And he gathered the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the east street. And he said unto me, hear me, you Levites. Sanctify now yourselves and... Sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of this place. So what are we being sanctified for? So that we can uh, attain unto a purity. So that when we have purity, then we are holy. When we are holy, we have power. 
When we have power, we're fit and meet for the master's use. And when we have power, then we are witnesses. Then our witness has a spirit of prophecy. It has an effect upon the world. It has a savor. And while we're talking about savor, you know, a lot of the time we as Christians, we don't want to, we don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers and we just want to get along with everybody. And uh, to a certain extent, you know, the Bible tells us as much as lies in us, let's be at peace with, you know, with all men as much as possible. And now those are all worthy things to pursue. But remember what Paul said also, the, the, uh, we don't want to be naive about the fact that there are people that are just not going to receive us. We're going to be hated. Yeah. We're going to be hated. And Paul said, but we are the savor of life and we're the savor of death. To them that are being saved, we're the savor of life. We're the, we're the smell of, of the promise of, of hope and glory of God and salvation to each other. Yeah. Whether, we, whether we're... we're Exhorting one another or rebuking one another or reproving one another. It's still the, it's still the essence. It's the savor. It's the, uh, uh, the savor of life. We know it's for life. But to those who are not saved, we are the savor of death. They don't like you because when you're around, all it reminds them is the doom and gloom. And the, it, it's the, uh, it's the witness to their conscience that that God is going to judge the world and they're not, you know, they're not saved and they don't like that. So sometimes we have to be a saver of death. We have to be the, the negative vibe to the people that are not being saved and, and therefore will clash. They won't like it. What fellowship does light have with darkness? When it says live peaceably as much as life in, in you, live peaceably with all men, doesn't mean be friends with the world. You know, it doesn't mean overextend yourself and volunteer and, and compromise your sanctification and your holiness because you want them to like you. Everyone isn't going to like you. People aren't going to all like us all the time. So there's something there to work out. So we're the savor of death to them that perish, we're the savor of life to them that are saved. But anyway, we have a command. Hezekiah represents, of course, Jesus, as we'll see further on. And he gives the command. Hey, you Levites, sanctify yourselves and then sanctify the house of the Lord. All right, and this is the importance of the Levites or the chiefs. Uh, I mean, the Levites in general represent God's elect. But you see here, the Levites were a, a authority of priesthood, and then you had the congregation. So first, the authorities had to, uh, the men of the authorities of those days were commanded to sanctify themselves so that they could sanctify the rest of the house of God. All right, now Jesus in John 17, I already read some of this. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy, truth. thy word is truth. And the word is manifested through preaching. Okay, so it all begins with preaching. Revealing the word of God. Revealing the word of truth. And that word of God motivating and empowering people and setting them on a course of sanctification and seeking God while he may be found and working out their salvation with fear and trembling and getting ready to meet God and maintaining that mindset through the preaching, continuing in it. And for their sakes, here's Jesus, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself. See that? Hey, Levites, sanctify yourselves and sanctify the house. Yeah. Jesus says, I sanctify myself for their sakes so that I can sanctify them. Okay, there's the mind of Christ. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That sounds like you and me here tonight. That they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So as much as we sanctify ourselves, 
as much as we attain unto holiness and purity and get to a place of God that God can declare us to be the Son of God, uh, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And where is the testimony of Jesus? Is it in your mouth? No, the word of faith is in your mouth. The word of faith is nigh thee, even in your heart and in your mouth. But the, the word of our testimony is our conversation, our life, that which is revealed in the flesh. And that's why you sanctify the flesh. So that it can demonstrate the righteousness of God. Not your own righteousness. You see, not your own. But the righteousness of God. Nevertheless, something righteous has got to be manifested in your flesh. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. All right. And that's what it means to put on the wedding garment. Oh, you believe. Yeah, the devil believes. There's more to this than just believe, believe, believe. The devil believes, trembles. Thou believest there is one God, the devil believes, and devils believe and tremble. Now let's go back to Second Chronicles 29. So, so sanctify yourselves and then sanctify the house of the Lord. Why? To get pure, to get the filthiness out. So you can have, be sanctified, purified. Now you are holy which is a combination of separation and attainment to purity, now you have power. Now your testimony has power. Now your word has power. Now your life has power. See that? Uh, For our fathers have trespassed and done that which is evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. Now, it, back in Isaiah, I think it is, or Jeremiah, I think it's Isaiah, it makes uh, a statement about Thy first fathers have transgressed against me. So you look back, and I suppose every generation could look back and see the sins of their fathers, what have you. But, you know, we're living in a particularly apostatized church age. Our, fa our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, our God, and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turn their backs. Also they have shut up the doors of the po porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense. It means didn't pray. Incense is like prayer. okay? And have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment and to hissing as you see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters are, and our wives are in captivity for this. This is the scripture I was trying to find last week, and I couldn't remember where it was. And this is it. And so this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to play the even, even hand. The authorities can, can, can indict God's people for being rebellious and everything else, right? And you could say that, yeah, this is the generation that despises dominion and everything else. But there's reasons why dominion is despised. One, because, yeah, people are rebellious. But we have this vicious circle going on. What, what about what if the authorities give every occasion to, to, to rebellion? What if the life of dominions and authorities um, justify the rebellion or minister to the rebellion? What if too much offense is being given in many things and the ministry is able to be blamed? What, why is that? It's because we failed in sanctification. Now, I'm not putting, getting the rebels off the hook. We'll be better look at both sides of the equation. Because there's two things going on in our generation like that. There's two things going on. And as we say, you know, you can say, well, my son, he ain't serving the Lord. Now, he's just a rebel. Well, what, what has his experience been with dominion? And with authority. Okay? Because part of the indictment goes here. Our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity. He doesn't say for their rebellion. Because the fathers have fallen. The fathers have apostatized. And they've given this great occasion and strength to the rebellion. And to the apostasy of, uh, of the rest of the church. 
See, both sides got to shoulder their contribution to the problem. And so when you begin talking about restoration and sanctification, both sides got to consider their ways. From authorities down to uh, subordinates to, you know, from prophets to paupers, everyone's got to consider what's going on in the church and what the indictments are. And it's not a one-sided thing. As we said before, judgments has many balance weights and measures in the balance. Now, Hezekiah says, Now it's in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent. And last week, I think I was talking about diligence, or the week before, one of those last two messages. I spent a time talking about diligence. Well, the uh, opposite of diligence is negligence. So don't be negligent, be diligent. For the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him to serve him and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. We're in the fire of God. If we're going to be purified, we are in the afflicting fire of God. And whenever you put something into the fire, it produces smoke or some kind of vapor of some kind of thing like that, right? And my Bible talking about the lake of fire, it says the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. The smoke or the smell or the incense or the offspring, the result of fire is the incense or the smoke, which represents the cry or the prayer. So when you are in hell, you are in torment, you have a crying torment and you let out your crying torment and it becomes a smoke that goes up into the air. The Bible says it ascends up forever and ever and ever. No one ever hears it. No one ever receives it. It's just a smoke that keeps going on, drifting aimlessly forever and ever. But when you're a child of God and you're in the fire of God, it produces a cry, and that cry is for the purity, for the holiness for the righteousness, for the testimony, for the image of God, for the manifestation of the sons of God in the church, in our mortal bodies, to have a testimony in the earth, to have a nail in God's holy place, to have a function, a role, a life in God and Jesus Christ. And you're in a fire and something is hindering that from coming to its full Purity, it's full perfection, and it grieves you, and it pr produces a cry in your heart that the glory of God and the righteousness of God is being hid because of some mystery of iniquity in my heart, and it makes a cry, a cry for deliverance, and that's not a smoke, that's an incense. It's a cry to God for help, a cry to God for deliverance, a declaration of your dependency upon Him, Hoping in his mercy. And that incense is a prayer that becomes a sweet savor. In the nostrils of God. You're sending forth an incense. And you send out a forth incense, not just a cry for yourself, but for each other. You see your brother struggling and grieves you and you send up a cry on his behalf. So whenever he, the byproduct of fire is either smoke or vapor or incense. It's some vapor kind of thing. And it ascends. It ascends. And if you're the righteous, it's an incense that reaches God. If you're not, if you're the wicked, it's a smoke that just ascends up forever and ever. No one ever hears the cry. So that's burning incense. I get my place back. Yeah, you have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. This is what I've been saying all along. I try to emphasize from time to time. Yeah, there's mercy, there's grace for stumbling and everything else. When you're in pursuing holiness, when you're striving against sin and you stumble. The grace of God is to cover you when you're striving against sin and you stumble. Never was the grace of God given so that you can deliberately strive towards sin. See, that's, that's different. Now your iniquity is imputed. Now your iniquity is marked. Now you're headed for judgment. Now you're in trouble because you're transgressing grace. And you're going to fail the grace of God, which is given to you to give you a space to perfect holiness, 
perfect holiness. Perfect holiness of flesh and spirit. First, spirit first, then flesh, and we'll get to that. So, put out the lamps, have not burned incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the Lord God of Israel. So, my, my thing is, no incense. Okay, so if you, if you fail somehow, and you do a deed in your flesh that's, that's unrighteous, and, it's, and you know it is, and, you didn't, and, and you're striving not to, but it got the best of you, that should make a cry in your heart. That should be a cry in your heart. We're back to the man forcing a woman in the field in, in Deuteronomy. And uh, the man shall be put to death because he forced the woman, but the woman cried out. She cried out. And because she cried out, she shall not be put to death. There's no sin in her worthy to death. For she was in the field, no one to help her, and she cried out. But how about a man force a woman in the field and neither the man nor the woman cry out. They'll be both put to death. The man because he forced the woman. The woman because she didn't cry out. She didn't nonchalant. She didn't cry out. This, is, this represents, the man represents Satan overpowering, overwhelming your flesh, forcing you to do something evil. And you succumb to it. Right? So you succumb to an evil deed. Is there any cry in your heart? Is there any cry in your heart? So that's the question. Where's this cry? Where's the cry? Okay, that's what it means. There's no, they haven't burned incense. They haven't, there hasn't been a cry in the heart. A real cultivated love for the righteousness of God that makes it a devastation. Isaiah said it, to this man will I look. Even to a man that, that uh, yeah, but, but who uh, sacrifices a lamb as though he killed a man. Right? Who offers an oblation as though he cut off a dog's neck. This is the man I'll look, the, the contrite guy, that when he has to offer a sacrifice for sin, or he has to invoke the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus because he committed a sin, it's not a nonchalant thing. It completely breaks, breaks you down. Some dog has to be cut off because they see my unrighteousness in it unrighteousness going on in my flesh. Some dog is cut off. Some heathen is hardened against the things of Christianity because of my flubs and fairies. A dog, you cut off a dog's neck, you know. It's as though you slew a man. He that offers a lamb, of course the lamb is Jesus, right? Okay, so this is why our daughters and wives are in captivity. Not because they're a bunch of, of uh, hoodlums and rebels and wicked people. Not just because of that. Because our fathers have fallen away. Our fathers have fallen by the sword. Because the church has failed. Because we don't have savor. Because there's something that we miss, all of us, in, in the issues of sanctification. So now it's in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel. Yeah, so... Minister to him and burn incense. So then the Levites arose, and there's a whole list of Levites that arose, and they gathered them, their brethren, and they sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. The inner part. The council of God that's going in and that exposes or that... Uh, um, the part of the Word of God that's quick and powerful that discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. That rightly divides between him that serves God, him that serves him not. The right use of grace and the wrong use of, use of grace. Just getting right in there and marking the difference. So they went into the inner part and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord and the court of the house of the Lord and the Levites took uh, it to carry it out abroad into the book Kedron. Now they began on the first day of the month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And then the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Then they went to Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels... Now, we're talking about vessels of the Lord here, of the house of the Lord. So what are we talking about in terms of now and today? Who are the vessels of the Lord? We are. We're the vessels of the Lord. We're the vessel, and we're carrying a supply of the Spirit, right? Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz, 
in his reign that cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified. Behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Now, some people fall away because they're not of God. Some people fall away because they're rebellious and they don't like the counsel of God and they're not really uh, set for the kingdom of God. Some people have no root in themselves and they fall away. But it's very clear here that there are some people that when King Ahaz was in his transgression, King Ahaz, his transgression caused him to put away and cast away actual vessels of the Lord. And that was because of King Ahaz's transgression that he cast away those vessels of the Lord. It wasn't the vessels of the Lord's transgression that caused them to be separated. It was the transgression of King Ahaz. Okay? Now, he said, Moreover, all those vessels that were cast away by King Ahaz in his transgression, have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. And I would like to be so bold as to think is that is what our exercise is here. We are sanctifying and preparing vessels of the Lord that have been cast away by those because they wanted to continue in their transgression. And it blinded them from the witness of that, that we are actually vessels of the Lord. All right. So then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bullocks and they did their sacrifices and sprinkling of blood and killed the rams and they sprinkled the blood on the altar and they brought the he goats and the priests killed them. And I'm just going through the stuff that's not important for this teaching at this time. So he set Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and harps. And so they had singing and music. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests sounded with, them, with their trumpets. Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And the burnt offering began. The song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and the instruments ordained by David. And the congregation worshipped and the singers sang. The trumpeters sounded and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And they made an end to offering, and the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves in worship. And Hezekiah and the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David. We're talking about restoration. Starts with sanctification. Then it starts, it continues with a restoration to bring back all the vessels that the king cast away in his transgression. Those who were actually vessels of the Lord. This is a pattern of restoration. Remember I was saying many are offended. Offended was scandal. Scandalizo. A lot of people were offended because of scandals in, in authority. King Ahaz and his transgression. So uh, they brought in sacrifices and thank offerings and burnt offerings and so on and so forth. So they consecrated 600 oxen and 3,000 sheep, sheep, but the priests were too few, they, so they could not flay all the burnt offerings, wherefore their brethren the Levites did help them till the work was ended and until other priests had sanctified themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. And that would be like the common saints are more... Uh, uh, they're more upright in heart to be sanctify themselves than somebody like me. I'm still more tangled up than a lot of the people who are not Levi, or not, not ministry, or not in positions of authority. That's, that's what that means. That, that's, that's the indictment against me or other ministers that have not, maybe we sanctify, but have not sufficiently sanctified our, ourselves. And so we need to hit this issue from time to time, because it's a fundamental thing. Again, this is the will of the Lord, what? Even your sanctification. Sanctification starts at the top. What if Jesus had not sanctified himself? None of us would be saved, right? That's right. Okay, so it always starts at the top. Always. Always. Yeah, and the onus is always on the top. And whenever you talk about charity and the things that people ought to do as a result of charity, the onus to begin charitable conduct 
and to forbear doing things that would make the other person offended, even if you think you can do it as an individual. You put off those things so that those under you are not offended. That is charity, and that always starts at the top. We love God because He first. Love God. Yeah. And that pattern comes all the way down. Never does the authority ever try to uh, indict or put an onus or indictment uh, against uh, the lower vessel concerning the, the uh, demonstration of charity. No, you, you as the us, us as authorities, it's up to us to demonstrate it and have charity first and foremost. The onus is on us, not on the weaker vessels to have charity. The onus is on the greater vessel to demonstrate charity, then the rest will follow through. Right? Did Jesus demonstrate charity before we did? Yeah, before we did. He didn't, he didn't uh, before we were ever saved or had a chance to be perfected, he didn't indict us and say, you ought to have charity. He didn't say that. No, no, he had charity first. While we're yet sinners, he had charity. Christ died for us. Now, he died, he, he, he rose again, he resurrected from the dead. Now, what's he doing? He's henceforth expecting. The rest is just going to follow. They're going to they're gonna be perfected. The rest is just going to follow through. They're going to love me. This people of I form... Form for myself, they shall show forth my praise. They shall return the charity that I uh, spent and exercised upon them. It will come back to me. All I have to do is just sit at the right hand of God, henceforth, expecting. So you, you as an authority, just do your charity. Do your charity. The sister's offended on a hug, don't hug her. Because if anything offends her, then it... I, charity will do nothing to offend my brother and my sister. And that's the end of the issue. That's the end of the issue. There's no counsel past that. Amen. Don't, don't say, oh no, the onus is on you that you ought to want, want to hug me. Because I'm the authority. And I stand as some sort of figure of God. And if you don't want to hug me, then you don't want to hug God. That's contrary to sound counsel. Amen. You're putting the onus of charity on the weaker vessel. The onus of charity is on the greater vessel. If they're offended, don't do it. Especially if it's not something not required for... It's good not to drink wine or do anything whereby thy brother or sister is weak or stumble or is offended. That is your charge. That is the charge and mandate of charity to authority. You show the charity. Anything else, you're failing the law of God. Don't put it on the weaker vessels. As we said before, woe by whom the offense cometh, not woe to them who is offended. Woe to them by whom the offense cometh. That is the only indictment of that scripture. You can't flip that one. That's not a flippable scripture. So, they do this, all this consecration and sanctification and have all kinds of thanksgiving and sacrifices and all of that. And then we find out that guys like me aren't as diligent to sanctify myself as a lot of you have. And that's, that's the indictment against us as authorities. Okay? So, you know, so I have to take that into account. So then Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people, and God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly. See, once God decides to move and things are ready, it doesn't always take as long as you think. Because a lot of what we think is going to take a long time is really God. God doesn't take a long time. We take a long time. Because we're not sanctified. <laughs> we haven't separated ourselves. God's waiting for that separation, that, that um, uh, cultivating of pure intent and want, the desire for purity and holiness, and then, then He can move. Then He can give us uh, power. Then He can give us His righteousness, and we won't abuse it. We won't misuse it. Right? So what, what's the issue here? Thinks, why is God taking so long? No, we're like Lot. We're hanging out, lingering in Sodom and Gomorrah. The problem wasn't God. The problem was Lot. He wasn't sanctified. Too, too much in Sodom and Gomorrah, you see? So, but once we get the sanctification thing, once we can get that right, how long is it going to take God? How long is it going to take God? Saying Jesus Christ has paid the price. He made the declaration. It is finished. God said, I'm giving you all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that called you to glory and virtue and grace and purity. God gave it all to you. We've got it all. It's done. It's finished. It's paid for. It is finished. It's not going to take God long to do anything once we're ready. 
The preparation of the heart and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. There's a preparation. So let's set aside by preparation. You know, you talk about things like Sabbath. You know, keeping the Sabbath is probably not as important as preparing to keep the Sabbath, right? So if I don't prepare to keep the Sabbath, Sabbath comes and I'm not prepared and my mind is in a bunch of worldly things. All of a sudden, I'm in Sabbath, but my mind's still in the world. You see that? Mm-hmm. Your mind has a momentum. Your spirit has a momentum. Friday starts coming along. Sabbath comes. Preparation for the Sabbath. Preparation for the Sabbath. The Great Tribulation isn't going to probably be as much of a problem as making sure we're prepared mm-hmm. for the Great Tribulation. You see what I'm saying, right? Well, this is it. Preparation. And that's what sanctification is. Sanctify, separate, prepare. So maybe instead of uh, emphasizing Sabbath for a while, we should emphasize preparing, and then the Sabbath will have its effect. We'll actually be in rest and peace on the Sabbath day. As we said before, there's the Sabbath is a uh, a legitimate thing, both natural and in the spirit. You know, God wants us to actually remember the Sabbath day literally and to keep it holy. And then furthermore, he wants our hearts to be in a spiritual Sabbath where we cease from our own works. Okay, so I don't have problems doing things on the Sabbath uh, that's not servile work. I don't legalize the Sabbath. But I think as a general principle, it has to be different than the other days. It has to be different. A little more set aside it can't be just the same as every other day. And that's just my advice. And I'm, I'm studying Sabbath. I'm putting some counsel together for it, and I may do that some other time. So anyway, the thing was done suddenly. So Hezekiah sends to all Israel and Judah and writes letters to Ephraim and Manasseh and that they should come to the house of the Lord of Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. Now, who is the Passover? Christ, our Passover. To keep the Passover means to... Gather together unto Jesus, deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him, and prepare to meet God. That's so that we walk in the fellowship of his sufferings. We become the body of Christ that gets crucified to the world, and the world gets crucified to us. That is keeping the Passover in the New Testament spiritual sense. Okay, So that's how we perceive that when we read the scripture. Not literally killing a lamb or anything like that. Now, if you want to observe the day of Passover, literally, that's fine. I mean, you can regard the day or not regard the day. And uh, I, I wouldn't judge any man who regards it, and I wouldn't judge any man who regards it not. But I wouldn't make an ordinance or a doctrine out of it or a requirement out of it. But we know, we know what the Passover is. If we're going to keep literally, literally keep a Passover and, and set aside that actual Passover and get together and have a service, then we ought to talk about Christ as our Passover, and we ought to... Magnify those things. Okay, but anyway, so now that makes this scripture relevant anytime. It's not just Passover, because Christ is our Passover. The king had taken counsel and princes and all the congregation to keep the Passover in the second month, for they could not keep it at that time. What, the, what couldn't they keep? The Passover? Because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem, and the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So why couldn't they pick up their cross and follow Jesus? Why couldn't they deny themselves? Why couldn't they apply themselves to purity and sanctification and holiness and everything else? Why? Because the priest had not sanctified. They were still pursuing their worldly ambitions, their worldly lusts, their fleshly lusts. Again, I'm not talking about people who are striving against those things and happen to stumble and fall. I'm talking about people who actively, deliberately, proactively, excessively strive towards those lusts. And so the priests just just don't think it was important, so they didn't bother. All right. And the thing pleased the congregation. I'm into chapter 30 now, if you haven't already noticed. They established a decree to make proclamations throughout all Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, that they should come and keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. You see that fulfilled? See the Laodicean church age? Our fathers, our first fathers have sinned. Laodicean church age turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, turned the things of God into merchandise. 
made the goal of the gospel prosperity instead of perfection? Things of this life instead of the things of the next life? Set your affection on riches and houses and lands instead of setting your affection on the things above? You know, when they, when they preach, oh, God wants you to have good things. The, the apostles went out and they, they brought in so many fish that their net break, their boat broke. That's how much prosperity they have. And then they, most of them failed to tell you that they left it all ashore and followed Jesus, left it all behind. Right? Behold, these are the ungodly. They prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Blessed are the poor. You know, go to how are you rich men. How hardy do they with riches? This is scripture and dice against all, all the way down the line. So wait, I'm getting too sidetracked here. But anyway, it's uh, they could not keep it in such sort as it was written. Where is it? They had not kept the Passover a long time in such sort as it was written. Where do you hear really about these prosperity preachers suffering? In fact, Kenneth Copeland was quoted as saying, that if Paul had the revelation that we have today, he wouldn't have had to suffer. Really, when the whole foundation of the gospel is that you're made perfect through sufferings, the whole call of perfection, pick up your cross, follow me. If we suffer with him, we'll live and reign with him. Okay, why? They could not, they had not picked up their cross and denied themselves in a long time in the way that, that it's been written in this Bible. Isn't that true? Our previous church age, it's been a long time since you've seen people who really consecrated, sanctified, laid down lives, are really, really diligent, are setting their, just setting their foreheads against the things of this life. Now, even if I'm temporarily in a state where my flesh still would like to have something in this life, I'm setting my forehead against it. Because I fear God. And I see this is the commandment of Jesus Christ. Sanctify yourselves. This is the will of God. Your, even your sanctification. The body is for the Lord. Not for all those other things. I could say fornication, but people get tired of me harping on fornication and you get criticized for it. Of course, including it, right? Well, it's a long time since we've uh, kept this thing as such as was written. And also, the people had not gathered themselves together to Jerusalem, meaning the, the body of Christ was still fragmented. There were still dry bones. There were still broken pieces of the ship that hadn't been all come together. You know, as the body of Christ comes together, that is, that's, that's the body, that's a work of sanctification where the body, each, all the members of the body come together and they become sanctified and joined together as one. And the more members of the body you have together, the more sanctification, the more Holiness and no more power. That, that's why I, I really emphasize the fact that we should gather together. Now, I mean, some people do not have the occasion to gather with others. They are in extremely isolated circumstances. And they have no fellowship and there's no one around. And if your fellowship is to call somebody or text messaging, uh, I think the grace of God covers you there. I think that's fine. But if you have opportunity... And you're around people who are Christians. And you have opportunity to sit down and be sanctified and gather together. And with more of that gather together in the singleness of I, in the purity. You know, if your I be single, yes, we all need to get together. So we have power. So we have anointing. So that our I can be single, clear, singular vision. So we can sanctify and purify and prepare the vessels of the Lord that have been cast away in the transgressions of whoever King Ahaz is. Right? Can you imagine if I was sitting here preaching by myself? I wouldn't have this liberty. I wouldn't have this anointing. I wouldn't have this emphasis and all of that. That, that comes. When you are, Paul said to the church, when you are gathered together with my spirit and the spirit of Jesus Christ, then you have power. You have anointing. You have an authority to execute judgment, to deliver this one over to Satan, or to do this, or to do that. Not just to deliver such a one over to Satan, which is the context of that scripture. But you also have power to do other things. To exhort, to build up, to edify, to encourage, to strengthen, to heal, to pray, to cast burdens on one another, edify one another. 
you shall receive power. You can't do it without the power. The power is not without sanctification, and it's not without holiness, and it's not without the gathering of the saints. They couldn't have power to keep the Passover. Why? Because the, they were not yet gathered to Jerusalem, and because the Levites were not sanctified enough from their own lusts and pursuits and ambitions. Therefore, those transgressions ended up casting vessels away. So, you see the importance of it. You see the whole pattern here. So, the posts go with letters from the king and from the princes, and they went all throughout Israel and Judah, according to the command of the king, saying, Hey, you children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. And be not like your fathers and like your brethren which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as you see. Now seeing God has given us less than our iniquities have deserved, right? And see he's reward, he rewarded us less than, than what we deserve. Should we again join an affinity with worldly pursuits and lusts and the peoples of this land? Is that what we should do? I will hear what the Lord will speak. He will speak peace to his people, but don't turn again to your folly. Because God will wound the hoary head, head or scalp of such a one that just keeps continuing on in his trespasses. He will feed those, the strong with judgments, and he will deliver the poor out of their hands. All right. Don't be like your fathers and your brethren which trespass against the Lord. Don't be stiff-necked like your fathers. Yield yourselves to the Lord. Enter into His sanctuary with the, which He has sanctified forever and serve the Lord your God. But the fierceness of His wrath may turn away from you. For if you turn again unto the Lord, then your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive so that they shall come again into this land. Talk about restoration. Talk about a criteria. Criteria and the uh, mandate is given to the ruler, the chiefs, the fathers, the Levites. Turn again to the Lord. Don't be stiff-necked. Yield yourselves. Then your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land, for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return from if you return unto him. That's the mandate. That's the criteria. That is the requirement. That's the prerequisite. That's what has to happen before you get your brethren and your children and your wives restored unto you. That's the way it is. It's just like Second Chronicles 7, 14. Pray for forgiveness all you want, but if you don't, if your heart doesn't come to the proper condition, which is a criteria, which is a prerequisite, when every man shall know his own sore and own grief. Then, then. See, it's a sorrow. It's a cry. It's not a haughtiness. It, it's, it's, it's not a brow beating. It's not anything else. It's, it's, it's a humility. It's a humility. It's a brokenness. It's a cry. Well, uh, you can say it all you want, but God has to work and the individual has to seek that out and we all have to work that out. So the posts passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim to Manasseh, even to Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. You know, a lot of so-called Christians mock this sort of thing about coming out of the churches, coming out of the religious world, gathered together to Jerusalem where I put my name there. You, know, you shall not eat your Passover in all the gates that you choose. You shall not eat the Passover. You shall not deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus and, and the, the denominational churches that you, you like or that you choose or that man chooses. But you shall eat your Passover in the place that the Lord thy God shall choose to put His name in there. What's the name of the church? The church of Jesus Christ. Yep, not of apostolic faith, not of Latter-day Saints. It's the church of Jesus Christ. It's not a denominational church. God has not put His name there. God has put His name in His church, in His body who is a sanctified, separated, called out, come out from among them. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's holiness, that's sanctification. Come out. Come out from the religious world, the denominational system. Come out from among them. 
Come out from the practices of the world, from the pursuits of the world. Come out, and I will receive you. Then you'll be sanctified. Then you'll be purified. You'll be sanctified, separated onto the purification operation of God, which will make you holy, which will then finally leave you with power. No holiness, no power. No purity, no holiness. No sanctification, no purity. We'll work our way back. <laughs> so they mocked him. Yet there were various people of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun that did humble themselves and came to Jerusalem. So, so some people will gather, sanctify, come out of the church world and actually sit down and congregate with the people of God. As the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. As a matter of some is. So they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem and the altars, for instance, they took away and cast them into the brook Kedron. They killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month and the priests and Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner according to the law of Moses, the man of God, and the priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passovers for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And here's the power that we have with sanctification coupled with the knowledge of this word of God being preached, which preaching should come, make faith come forth. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. We have a condition. They, they sanctified, they separated, and yet they had not been completely purified or cleansed, yet they did take of the Passover. That would be like picking up your cross and following Jesus, and then you're afflicted or you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, and then... They, but because you're not fully cleansed, you may eat and drink kind of, let's say, unworthily. In, instead of rejoicing that you're counted worthy to suffer for his name, you, instead you get ill and you get bitter. And you feel like an injustice has been done to you. Well, that, you're picking up your cross. You're eating the Passover, but you're not fully cleansed, so you're eating it otherwise than it was written. Yeah. The, way it, the way it was written is you pick up your cross and, you, and then when you suffer for righteousness, you're happy. Right? You, you glorify God on this behalf, but you fail to do so. You get embittered, let's say. And the Bible says, if you eat and drink unworthily, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. Because you don't discern the Lord's body. You don't realize you are actually a part of the Lord's body being persecuted. And if you would discern that, you would take it with joy in your heart. And yet, even for all that, because these people had done the first step and sanctified themselves... Hezekiah says, I'll pray for him. The good Lord pardon every one of you. Right? That's Jesus at the throne of, of God. The great high priest making intercession for us. Oh, they're not picking up their cross like they were supposed to be. Or they're not responding to the slanderers like they're supposed to be. They're getting ill and they're getting uh, bitter and everything else. And, and so, But if, you're, if you have your heart sanctified, Hezekiah or Jesus, the high priest, is making intercession for you. Say, pardon them, Lord. They sanctified themselves. They're not cleansed, but they're going through the cleansing. And look, their hearts are set for the Lord God of their fathers. The good Lord pardon everyone who has prepared his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, even though you're not fully cleansed exactly the way it's been written. And what did the Lord do? The Lord hearkened to Hezekiah, or God hearkens to Jesus our high priest, and he healed the people. So that's what follows next, is the cleansing and healing of your hearts. And as you keep going on, you'll, you'll drink more worthily and more worthily and more worthily. You'll recognize that this is the communion of, of passion and charity with Jesus Christ. This is your closeness to each other and your, your unity with, with God. It's through the sufferings. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of the unleavened bread seven days with great gladness and so on and so on. And then Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days and offered peace offerings and so on and so on. So there was great joy in Jerusalem. See what follows in the restoration. 
The joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy. For since the time of Solomon, the king of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Well, if I dare say, if we're in the end of the age, I'd say, I dare say, since the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, when this great tribulation comes and God restores all of this and we go through this pattern of restoration and God finally fills us with joy, it's, it's not the like since you've seen since, since the day of Pentecost. Remember we're saying that this woman has anointed me for the burial, for the death, for the, the great tribulation where the body of Christ gets persecuted and as, as it were crucified. Let me take a quick look at John 17 again. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son that the son may also glorify thee. So God wants to glorify us so that he is glorified. And this is the whole thing. Uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We've heard this said. Uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in us is the hope of us being glorified with the glory of God. And it's the hope of God being glorified and seeing his own glory reflected back through us. It's, it works both ways there. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, Jesus has power over all flesh. Does he not fill all things now? Right Now he's just waiting for everything to be fulfilled until everything is fulfilled and then he'll turn around and then he'll, you know, all things have been put in subjection under him, but it's excluded that God is above him. God as a spirit has not been put subject to Jesus as is the body of Christ. But then when all things are fulfilled, he'll deliver the whole kingdom back up to the Father that God may finally be all in all. But for now, he is Jesus, the head of the church. He fills all things. He has all power. All power and heaven and earth has been given unto me. He has power over all flesh. Is that your flesh? Is that my flesh? Is that Donald Trump's flesh? Whose flesh are we talking about? All flesh! ultimate power over all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created all things created by him for him that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him and this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent I have glorified thee on the earth so we're to glorify Jesus on the earth and in the earth thy, thy will be done on earth or in earth as it is in heaven I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known on that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given to me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them has lost, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now I come to thee. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. All right, and back to the sanctification issue. Now, Jesus sanctifies himself so others can be sanctified. It comes down like that. So let's uh, tie that in again with the importance of sanctification in body, spirit, for I got for. Uh, the Lord sanctify you and preserve you, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved unto the coming of the Lord. Not, not that your whole spirit and soul be preserved blameless, but your flesh, you, 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 don't worry about your flesh, it ain't going to be sanctified until the Lord comes the second time. Nope. That's not the mark. <laughs> that's not the goal and that's not the vision. Okay, we got to get this one straight. 
Um, so you know how I always teach on the altar and the gift, because this is another issue of sanctification. Okay, Matthew 23, 16 to 22. Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. Whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Now what's the temple? Know ye not, ye are the... Okay, so the temple is our bodies. We're the temple of the Holy Ghost. So what is the gold? It's the gift, the gold. It's the Holy, Holy Ghost. As we said before, the Spirit dwelling in you with no knowledge, no preaching, no counsel, has no power. Because the power comes through the process of sanctification, purity, holiness, and power. The sanctification comes through the Word. I've given them thy Word. Because the, the Word of sanctification comes, the command comes through the preaching, all of that, right? So we need counsel. We need preaching, okay? God's Spirit, is God's Spirit any good to you? Is God the eternal Spirit any good to you? You don't have any access to Him. You're a sinner and you're separated from God. You start separated. Why, what, what is the only chance or the only opportunity you ever had to know about God or get saved or come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Is because a body, Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, sanctified Himself. As He said in John 17, For this cause I sanctify Myself, that they may be sanctified. I sanctify myself so the Spirit of the Father can be manifested through me so there's something you can see and touch and handle and hear and comprehend and understand and know what to do as far as preparing to meet God. And without Jesus there as the body of Christ, you'd have no access. So now Jesus has gone into heaven. Now he sends us. Now I'm sending them like you sent me, Father. What access does the world have to the things of God except through the body of Christ? And the body of Christ is not sanctified. Like if I don't sanctify myself, I mean I should sanctify myself more, but I do sanctify myself somewhat. So if I sanctify myself somewhat, I, I'm here and I'm, I'm preaching and I'm exercising my gift, right? Well, and that's the word of God. And I sanctifies them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He sends the word. Gives the command. Anyway, so that means that without the preaching... You don't know what to do, right? You don't know what to do. You know, you're supposed to fear God. Well, how do you fear what you don't know? And how do you know what you haven't heard? And how will you hear without a preacher? And how will they preach except they sent? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. God manifests His word through preaching. You know, give attendance through doctrine, through exhortation, through... On and on you go. How can I understand what I read except the man guide me? You go right on down the line with the scriptures here. Like that. So what's more important to you? The Holy Spirit floating around that you don't really know what, what the will of God is? Or the Holy Spirit in a vessel that's giving you something that you can understand? And to produce a vision of, of, of eternal life and righteousness and holiness and true purity and holiness. It's the vessel that's more important to you because it's the vessel by which you have access to the things of the Spirit. It's the, uh, it's the knowledge of the preached Word of God that looses the power of God. Of power, thou art Peter. Uh, uh, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven because I give you the keys, the keys of knowledge. The knowledge of God looses the power of the Holy Ghost in you to have effect upon you in your mind, in your conscience, motivating you to sanctify yourself. It's, it's the preaching, it's the knowledge that does that. It's the knowledge that are keys that unlock the power, both for good and evil. What unlocked the power of iniquity and evil upon the face of the earth? It was the counsel, the doctrine of Satan. Without that, it wouldn't happen. So what's more important, as we say, as I emphasize in Matthew 23, let me finish it. Whosoever swear by the temple, it's nothing. The flesh is nothing. It doesn't matter what goes on in the flesh. It's nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, now the spirit, now the spiritual issue, now you're a debtor. Oh, you fools and blind, what's greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold what's more important to you some eternal spirit of god you have no idea what he is who he is what his image is what his character is what he requires you or what's going on is that more important to you or the man that brings the description of god to you in a way you understand is that more important to you it surely is the temple is more important there and the importance of that temple motivates the man to sanctify himself. Do nothing. If it's in, in my power, I don't want to do anything that causes my brother to be stumble or to be weak or to be offended or to give any occasion that someone can blame me for something. 
Now, I may try my hardest and still something may, they may blame me for something. But I'm certainly not nonchalant about it, aren't I? I'm recognizing something that puts a fear in me and I'm trying to sanctify here. Because this is important. The temple is the most important thing to each other. Because it's through the temple that is revealed the image of God. You have nothing revealed to you without a temple, without a vessel. But the Pharisees are saying, oh no, the temple, the vessel, that don't matter. That's nothing. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about whatever that flesh does, testifies, does, demonstrates, what image it produces. Don't worry about that. Now the goal. Uh, now the goal. Now the gift. Now that's the important thing. Well, he goes on. What's greater, the gift? Okay. Whosoever shall swear by the altar, it's nothing. We know the altar, again, is the flesh. Where is the life of Christ offered in our generation? It's offered on the altar of our flesh. Whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind, whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. So what sanctifies the gift that makes it useful for your brother and your sister? What, what makes the gift useful and of value and it makes it of effect upon your brother and sister? It's, it's the altar that sanctifies that gift so it can be demonstrated and used. That is the important issue of all of this. The flesh is the important issue. You see what he's saying here? See, he's, he's actually saying the flesh is the more important issue than the spirit because the spirit can exist and, and be useless without the knowledge, without someone who has sanctified themselves and is able to yield to the gift to make it of value to bring others unto sanctification. So for the working out of our sanctification, the flesh is more important than the spirit. But you need them both. That's the emphasis of Matthew 23. Whosoever shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth thereon. And he that sweareth by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and him that sitteth thereon. And of course, we said it all before. Uh, by their fruit ye shall know them. The tree is known of its true, a fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. By their fruits ye shall know them. And when you're talking about fruit in the context of those statements of Jesus, the fruit is the final product of the tree. Right, you have an apple tree, right? It grows up uh, at the beginning as a little seedling. Uh, maybe you're, you, you're a botanical genius and you can say it's an apple tree, but some people who are not knowledgeable, they may not know it's an apple tree because it's just a little seedling coming out of the ground. And, you know, it can take its shape and everything else. But is the tree any good to you if it doesn't produce an apple? So, well, it can be an apple tree, but if there's no apple. You know, the fig tree, it comes to the fig tree, there's no fruit on it. Well, what is the fruit? It's the final result. And remember, the tree is something that has a root underneath, just like we have a root in our heart. Then there's a portion of that springs up out of the ground. Then there's a motion of, of water and sap and nutrients that come up the tree, which gradually form fruit, which is the final result of the tree. And we are the trees of righteousness. So we have a root in, in God and then we have inner spiritual workings that come up and begin to form things and finally the fruit becomes the thing that we do in our flesh. That's what it is. Yield you not your members as servants to unrighteousness. By their fruits shall you know them. Somewhere something has to happen in our flesh concerning the righteousness of God. Hey, I know I sound like a broken record with all these principles, but I, I'm, it does need to be emphasized. So, in the final end now, we want to be restored, we want to be healed, and we want to be broken, contrite, and humble. You know, seek meekness, and be, be all of you clothed with humility, because humility is the opposite of pride. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see, in God, see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you, persecute you, say all manner of evil against you, falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were 
before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thence good for nothing but be cast out and trodden under foot of man. And we certainly don't want to be in that condition. We need to find our savor. And just a little play on words, savior is S-A-V-I uh, O-R. And if you're with your savior and you can get rid of the I, it'll become your savior, S-A-V-O-R. Well, it's kind of a corny play on words, but it kind of says it in a way. All right, so that's it. I'm through my counsel, and I have nothing else to say.